Um, thank you, thank you for inviting me here today. Um, I'm here just to tell the story about what happened in Ipswich and the approach that we took, which was a very different approach um, to dealing with the issues of prostitution in Ipswich after the murders of five uh, women in December 2006. Can everybody hear me okay? Mm -hmm. um, so if I can start then, I'll talk a little bit about, and some of it does cross over because the, 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 the history uh, uh, is very similar. So Ipswich had a long history of prostitution, dating back many, many decades. Um, and in the 1960s, it was a problem in and around the port area of Ipswich. It was quite a big port back in those days. Um, in the 70s, after police enforcement, it displaced the issue. It moved to an area, Portman Road, which is near a football ground. Ipswich Town, a football team, they've got a football ground. <laughs> if you know anything about football, it's really, really good. But anyway. um, and and it wasn't unusual in the 60s and 70s to have about 25 women working out on the streets at night. But more latterly, up until the murders, they were predominantly local women and predominantly with drug addiction. So that, that was the sort of the, the history of it, really. And this was a, a paragraph that was put in the then Association of Chief Police Officers um, uh, strategy, um, outlining that, as we now know, prostitution is a complex subject. Society has an equivocal attitude towards it. Some view it as a moral, rather criminal issue. Some see it as a crime of abuse and exploitation. Others an issue of social care and welfare. welfare and some even regard it as a career of choice. So it was really sort of sat on the fence, I guess, around. Um, but I have certainly experienced um, all of those, and I'll outline my view as we, as we go through. So in Ipswich, prior to December 2006, um, and this is evidence that we had from the murder investigation, which gave a, a wealth of information. Um, there were 107 females who were working, or have been working, on the streets of Ipswich over a five-year period. Um, Twelve were persistently working and were being treated as a priority. And lots of unrest from local residents who lived in and around the local area. There were complaints from local businesses, and at that <coughs> time, it was an enforcement-only policy. The police were seen as the answer to the problem, um, and every time there were issues, the police, I, I was the superintendent of Ipswich, we would get phone calls, we would put resources out, of course, predominantly we would target the women, because that was the, the I guess, the easiest option, um, and it would die down a little bit, but it would always kind of come back. And if you like, you know, lessons we've learned over the years is that, you know, prosecuting the women, it has a bit of a negative impact, to be fair. But that was that situation at that time. Um, and then, of course, we tragically had to deal with the five murders. Um, Tanya Nicholl, Gemma Adams, Annalee Alderton, Paula Clennell and Annette Nichols, all young women um, working on Ipswich's streets selling sex, all addicted to Class A drugs. Um, the victimology of those women was quite stark when you understood their history. Uh, some came from very privileged backgrounds, but um, what was common amongst them all, apart from the drug addiction, was perhaps the coercion and the men behind them. Um, two of the women started prostitution as children, as 15, 16 year olds, and drug addiction. One of the women approached health services as a child for termination and for uh, sexually transmitted infection. None of that information was shared. These were children who were going to health professionals who were keeping a client, you know, uh, patient confidentiality. As a, I'm an LSCB chair, you know, a chair safeguarding children rules. That is a travesty. That information needs to be shared with authorities, but it wasn't in those days. And I'm very keen to ensure that agencies work much closer together to share information about vulnerable people. And we're seeing it more now, aren't we, around CSE, child sexual exploitation. Um, hopefully now agencies are working closer together and sharing that information. Not that this, if you don't come from Ipswich, doesn't tell you very much, but um, the red light, uh, the red lines, I guess, are just a way of outlining it's an area. There's the football ground. It's an area where there's some significant deprivation, a bit of an industrial area. But up the top north end of Ipswich, there's a very significant, nice housing area. Some of the most expensive houses in Ipswich. It's only in a five-minute walk to the train station into London within an hour. So a lot of you know high-profile people living in those areas. So so it's a big wide-ranging area encompassing you know, um, areas of deprivation, industrialisation, a football ground and, and very expensive housing. So it just gives you a bit of context really. 
What I just want to give you a flavour of is, is, is just a bit about the murder investigation, just to put it in some kind of context. Um, clearly Ipswich was the centre of an unprecedented, uh, unprecedented series of horrific crimes. It certainly was global headline news, Suffolk Constabulary faced one of the biggest challenges in British criminal history and certainly the biggest inquiry Suffolk had ever seen. And everything unfurled at such an incredible speed, which is what made it so, so unique. Uh, and just to put that in context, the time from the discovery of the first body until a suspect was charged was only 20 days. Um, and within that time we had five women murdered, um, a number of others as you can imagine because of these women living such chaotic lifestyles were reported missing. In addition to that there were another eight missing person inquiries on the go and we did wonder whether we were going to, any other women were going to be um, murdered at that time. So it was a very, very difficult and challenging time. But it was a very intense um, investigation, encompassed techniques at both ends of the spectrum, where we had at one end new, new and cutting edge technology, DNA profiling, the use of automatic number plate recognition. We had a multimedia presentation for evidence at a trial, just a few examples. But at the other end, basic policing skills, um, engagement with the public, local community, seeking their help and input, and offering reassurance, advice and protection. So it was, you know, encompassed a whole wide range um, of policing activity and, and, and of course it was headline news across the country and globally uh, and the pressure on all of us at that time was, was huge. Just some facts and figures, um, mutual aid was huge which is you know as a small force, Suffolk one of the smallest forces in the country, we, we obviously had the, the capability, what we didn't have was the capacity for such an investigation so 300 officers and staff from 40 different forces came to Suffolk 176 searches, 13,000 hours, 7,500 CCTV related exhibits seized, 13,000 calls from the public, 65,000 documents, media requests from all over the world. And I guess I mention this because, and, and that's, you know, the media will take over when you have such an investigation. That was outside the police headquarters and, and, and all the news anchors were there. But this could happen again. What happened to us in Ipswich, you know, while women are working on the street, in my view, you cannot make them safe. And this could happen again. Um, and, and, and the resources required to deal with it once it's happened it is, is huge. So Sunday the 17th of December 2006, self-confessed sex bias, Steve Wright, another myth to quash there really. Um, you know, it's often said to me, well the women need to have time to, to look at the men in the car and assess them, um, to make sure they're safe, and I, I've never known one tell me that they've held a sort of job interview for, for a punter, but actually, Steve Wright was a self-confessed sex buyer. The women felt safe with Steve Wright. He knew them, they knew him, and you know, he's the one who goes on to murder them. Subsequently charged, he was convicted of all five murders, and he's one of very few people in this country who is serving a whole life term. <clears throat> Which means he will die in prison. Okay, moving on to how we dealt with it then. Uh, as a response to Suma, as you can imagine, that was a big shock to Suffolk, a big shock to Ipswich. And a joint agency strategic group was formed. Um, it was all the senior leaders, it was ch chief police officers, uh, chief executives of the council and health service, the probation service, uh, the primary care trust, the drug and alcohol action team, mental health partnership, and that group came up with an overarching strategic aim to remove prostitution from Ipswich. That was their aim, and that's a strategic aim that never been achieved elsewhere. It was, you know, and that was what was passed to me and a team to sort of that was our job, if you like. To, to do that, and I remember a colleague saying at the time, blimey, they might as well give us global warming, it'll probably be easier. <laughs> but, but, um, but actually, when you started to look at it, you needed to challenge these old-fashioned views, you know, prostitution has always been here, it's always going to be here, you know, you can't do anything about it. Actually, you just needed to challenge that, and, we, and it gave us an opportunity to look at it in a totally different way. Um, I think I've mentioned it earlier, but previous strategies have not really been effective and maintaining the status quo was never going to be an option. Uh, and for me, you know, it wasn't just a police problem. It's not a police problem, it's everybody's problem. It's only going to be work, you're only going to make an impact into it if you all work together with the same strategic objectives. It was also quite clear, and having worked in the police for over 30 years, I spent a long time as a detective sergeant on what was a vice squad in the 1980s, and the same women who were working on the streets, and some of them were still working 
you know, many years on when I when I became the superintendent, and um, and it was quite clear that those punitive laws never worked, never worked for the women, and it, you know, particularly when, as you heard, some really emotive and moving stories from women who've been involved themselves. They didn't choose to do this. They were forced and coerced, and many of them were forced and coerced to go out and do that. And certainly, my experience. You know, the women in Ipswich, as I said there, many were coerced, fueled by drugs, very often victims of assault, robbery and rape, and sadly five young women lost their lives there. So what I wanted to do was have a real, if you like, a blank piece of paper, new opportunity, new ways of working, effectively looking at other places, looking at the way they, they did it, and, and our overall emphasis was to tackle the demand but offer support to help women exit, and that, that was ultimately the the aim. So, so we ended up writing a strategy and there were four of us who sat down um, over a couple of weeks because it, it was all pretty fast moving and we identified sort of five key aims really. Identifying the problem, um, we created problem profiles and we had some dedicated resources but we had a murder investigation and, and anybody who's been involved in it knows that it produces a wealth of information. You can understand who all the women are, who all the punters are, where they go, where the activity takes place. Um, so so we, we really spent a lot of time understanding what the problem was in Ipswich. Tackling the demand. I mean, we were going to come down really hard here on a zero tolerance enforcement for curb crawlers and men who buy sex. The clear message was that it's not okay for men to buy sex. Prevention. As I mentioned earlier, two of the women we knew been in care homes, had been uh, sexually exploited as children, had gone into prostitution as children, and we wanted to prevent the next generation entering prostitution. And therefore, back in 2006, and, and I know most, most areas, I'm sure it's all going on here now, identifying children at risk of child sexual exploitation, those who particularly disproportionately affects young girls in care homes, associating with older boys, drug addiction, um, coming home with gifts and toys and mobile phones they wouldn't otherwise have. And we, we trained up a lot of frontline professionals, social workers, police officers, health professionals, and, and they, they referred in to us children who they felt were at risk. Developing Roots Out, again, sort of another major part of the strategy. Uh, we created a dedicated team. Um, that was interesting in itself, actually. Mainly because um, we were told, and this was an area that did give me some cause for concern, that um, the women would not talk to statutory services. You had to have the voluntary sector as your dedicated team. We didn't have a voluntary, so we had a health, um, a health uh, focused outreach service uh, that was working. Um, <laughs> And it's interesting, we thought we were working in partnership before all of this and, and actually the health outreach had a very different approach and they wanted to go out on a Tuesday night and if the police were seen I'd get a phone call, what the hell were the police doing out on a Tuesday night, it's our night, you know, and they might have just been going to a job elsewhere. So there was no real joined up coordination. Um, but we, we wanted to have a dedicated team, but all I could get was, was police officers, social workers, family <coughs> practitioners, um, adult social workers, child social workers. And, and looking back now, it was fantastic. The women were happy to work with people who wanted to help them. And I think that's the key thing for me. Yeah. And it didn't necessarily have to be a voluntary sector Absolutely. or whatever, but, but it's, it's the, getting the right people in the team who wanted to work, work with and support the women. Um, so, of course, a lot of case management, a lot of coordination of services. I mean, and this was, you know, how were we going to be serious about this? You know, um, a lot of the women initially were sceptical of our approach. They thought, well, we want, for example, they wanted access to dentistry. A lot of women and, and those who work in the field will know that it rots the teeth. We laid on a dentist every Tuesday night at an outreach centre, and a lot of the women got new dentures. And, and it was those sort of, if you like, quick wins that would enable us to, to do that. Um, but drug treatment, we've talked about, coordination of services. We had a joint agency strategic team that used to coordinate with the services, but housing was a big issue. Um, we wanted to work with the women to stop their children being taken into care. Um, we wanted to, you know, that little things like blockages to, to services where a woman who had perhaps been in prison comes out, had to wait for 12 weeks to get any benefits. So what do they do? They go straight back out on the street. So we had to work with the local authorities and say, look, they're day, day one, they need their benefits now. Can't wait for 12 weeks. So we were able to break through all those barriers. Um, but like I say, housing, 
healthcare, housing was one of the biggest issues um, and, and a, one that, that still, still is problematic today. And the final, the fifth um, aim really was around community intelligence and, and regular briefings with the community. I say they're still ongoing. Um, I think it's moved on, it's a different issue now, a lot of street drinking in that area, which they're still carrying on those meetings. But for, for five years, every three months, I met with the community. Um, the very first meetings were very, very difficult, very challenging. Lots of people um, wanting to have a go at the police uh, around letting this sort of thing happen. Um, you've done, you've said all this before, it's never going to happen, it's never going to change. But, you know, and, and, and so we were totally up front and we explained how we were going to go about delivering the strategy, you know, zero tolerance to the curb crawlers, but we would offer support to the women because that didn't go down well with some. Some people felt that these women should be locked up, the key should be thrown away. Um, but uh, hopefully, uh, and as time went on, they saw the benefits. So, so but uh, as I said right at the beginning, this is not a one agency issue. I mean, this cannot be dealt with by one agency. You all have to work together and have be signed up to the same way of dealing with it, to be signed up to the same approach, you know, what, what's your ultimate strategic aim, what do you want to do, how do you want to, to deal with it, and all work together to, to achieve that. So what did we do? Um, through case conferencing, the most vulnerable and active prostitutes were identified. Um, they were offered assistance from a variety of agencies, obviously roots out, I mean, because again, it was very intensive, and I had a team out every night of the week, so you know, if the women were out working and the men were being arrested, there wasn't any punters for them. And it was challenging, but you know, we had the right people in the team working with the women and helping them out. Um, when they failed to actively engage, then consideration was given to enforcement through proactive work and ASBOs to ensure their safety and quality of life of residents. During the whole of the five years of strategy, only two women were, were given ASBOs, um, and they were very broad, and they weren't breached, and the women engaged with services. Um, but enforcement against the women was a last resort, um, and that was a key part of our, of our strategy. Um, use of technology, um, AMPR, automatic number plate recognition, CCTV, big investment by the local council. Um, but it was robust enforcement against the curb crawlers, and like I say, police were out every night of the week um, arresting the men. Um, so within the first two years, so this takes us through to 2009. 140 curb crawlers were arrested. Um, 130 men were cautioned. Six men were charged. Um, it was quite clear that what we would do with the men, would, they would all be arrested, they would be fingerprinted, they had their DNA taken, they had the photograph taken. If they had no previous convictions, um, and believe you me, most of them were happy to admit to it because they knew the options, and most of them were married, in long-term relationships, had children, which is another issue I think, you know, no one's died through not having access and all of that, as Fiona said, what's this need for men to want to do this? And when I ask the men, well, why do you do this? It's because I can do what I want. I'm paying for it, I can do what I want. And that helps me sort of form my view over time that actually this is not, you know, this is not right. Men should not be able to abuse and exploit women in that way. Um, Interestingly, only six men were charged, because going back they would be cautioned. If they weren't cautioned or didn't admit their guilt, they would get charged. Um, the other thing we spoke about was around naming and shaming. Naming and shaming the men. Um, and there was a lot, we were divided on that. Um, but actually the ultimate decision was that we wouldn't name and shame the men, because they all have wives and families and it's the children and the wives Absolutely. that get Absolutely. that get the abuse and, 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 and problematic issues mm -hmm. rising from, from the naming and shaming. So we, we were determined not to do that, but actually once somebody gets charged, it's in the public domain, um, and the biggest publicity we got, because one of the men charged was happened to be a police officer, mm -hmm. a Metropolitan Police Detective Sergeant, who lived in Suffolk. Um, it's another story, I shan't bore you with it, but uh, he was looking for a burger band. So, yeah, right. Yeah, as you do. <laughs> Literally caught He's with his trousers man. down, and that woman did it to him. Yeah. Anyway, he was found guilty. Didn't lose his job, interestingly enough. He certainly would have done in Suffolk, but he didn't in the Met. Um, over 400 children were identified as being at risk of sexual exploitation, and that number was continued to increase. So, you know, it was, I, it was good for... doesn't mean to say that there were 400 children that were being abused or exploited, but it was great vulnerable. that frontline practitioners were identifying the vulnerable children potentially at risk of entering 
this lifestyle and we're able to work with the team to, to do that. Okay, challenges. Obviously, I mean, this is a very quick run through and I'm conscious of time, but there were huge challenges. And uh, as I'm sure you will all know, if you're all working with this, it's a very challenging, difficult subject. Um, getting agreement from all agencies was one of the biggest challenges, um, but we got there in the end. Challenging negative attitudes, finances and resources. I know, I'm sure agencies here will say, you know, well, finances and resources and particularly currently are very, very tight, but you know, it's, it's the cost if you don't kind of do something about it and the, the cost of investigation of murders and rape. Um, and you know, actually children going into care, women going into prison for shopping, all these things, you know, and, and I'll talk a little bit in a minute about the analysis we did around funding. Um, making sure all involved are coordinated and provide a response and are signed up to the same approach so that everybody is singing from the same hymn mm -hmm. sheet. Mm -hmm. You've not got one agency here saying, well, actually, you know, we think you should be, it's your choice to do that when the bloody police are out there nicking people. You know, actually, we're all signed up, we're all doing the same thing. And um, a challenge to continue the strategy in the long term. I mean, the, the, I mean I'm sure there's some councillors in the room. The councillors want this done quickly, you know, we'll give you a year. Well, actually, it's a bit more complicated than that, and drug addiction can take many years. So eventually we did get a consensus that we were allowed to have a five-year strategy to do this, um, and how it would continue in the long term, and how we would keep in touch with all the agencies and, and, the, and, the, um, and the residents to ensure that they were reassured that, that we would continue with that work. Um, so another t t issue for us was um, uh, and during the, the course of the strategy, me in particular, because I was fronting it in the media, the big issues for me was, well, all you're going to do is drive it underground. Where's it going? Because it has to be there. Prostitution is the oldest profession. So, you know, if it's not there now, where is it? You've just driven it further underground and you've made it more dangerous for the women. Um, and I was very conscious about that because, you know, the, the safety of the women is what is paramount here. This is, for me, what was the key issue. The lesson from Ipswich was how vulnerable these women were. And I, I really genuinely wanted to understand, was our approach effective? So we employed the University of East Anglia, UEA, to do a full evaluation of the strategy over five years, version one at two and a half years, and version two after almost year six, actually. Um, it cost us quite a lot of money, but we wanted to give them full access to all the agencies, access to the women, um, access to the officers, access to the people, and, and really wanted to understand, you know, were we effective? Could we do something better? Um, was this an effective approach? Was it the right approach? Um, and ultimately, you know, obviously to cut a long story short, and these evaluations are quite weighty tones, uh, and they're available on the internet, but, but they did actually say, you have made a real impact and, and got rid of code crawling you have made a real impact and over 80 women have exited prostitution. <laughs> and of course, you know, we would know, I mean, I was stood up at the early days saying this was our, our intention was to remove prostitution. Everybody said, well, that's not going to happen, is it? Can we come back in two years, in five years and interview you? Well, they did come back and they didn't want to interview me because it was so successful. Um, you know, and you may have heard different things and people are willing to you know, turn around and say Ipswich has not worked. It has worked. Um, I spoke, I came up and saw Jalna a month or so ago and, and, and I hadn't, I've been retired now for five years and I spoke to the Neighbourhood Watch coordinator and I just said to him, you know, uh, what's life like for you now? You know, we're now 11, 12 years on. And he said it is amazing, you know, that, that they thought they lived in a racetrack. You know, that the circuit that the curb crawlers were doing, they thought they lived in a busy part of Ipswich. It's the most quiet area of Ipswich. They now have street parties every summer to celebrate it. You know, the council did an awful lot of work redesigning the areas, cutting off, you know, putting in flower beds and all the rest of it. So, so it's, um, so we, we wanted to find out how effective we were, and I think the evaluation did do that. Um, and through the media, local pressures, such as residents and councillors, we were regularly being informed whether or not it was, it was making a difference. So the current position, now I, I can only talk, I mean I retired, like I say, five years ago. Um, this can probably be updated because I have spoken to some officers since then, but there were no women working as prostitutes or men curb crawling between 2008 and 2016. That's what I can categorically say. Um, 
as we went through, and because of our successes in the early days of street prostitution, we did update the strategy to incorporate off-street prostitution. Now, what makes life complicated in all of this, and, and I'm sure the police officers here will know that, but actually, prostitution in this country is not illegal. Um, the act of selling sex is not illegal. The act of buying sex is not illegal. Although most men, when you find them in a brothel, think they are breaking the law. So why we don't do it, I don't know. But, um, but we did need to look at off-street prostitution. Um, but we needed to prioritise. Um, we wanted to prioritise where we had intelligence. There was links to organised crime. Evidence of child abuse, child sexual exploitation, <coughs> trafficking and coercion, and community nuisance and antisocial behaviour. So they were sort of the key areas that we, we prioritised. And the team would go out and visit. Now I'm sure, you know, it's, it, it does go on everywhere. And, and with the law as it currently stands, you know, it's one of those things that's always probably going to be there until the law does change. But even in towns, uh, counties like Suffolk, quick trawl of the internet will tell you we had like four, 450 premises selling sex across the county, but the team would visit every premises and offer the card and offer the support and the exit process to those women as well. And obviously we did have successes in, in trafficking and took, took um, people to court for trafficking and running brothels, etc. So that is a very, very brief run through. I'm conscious I've probably overdone my time, but um, I'm sure there'll be chance to questions later on or whether you want to do questions now. Again at the end. I just want to say amazing yeah. and well done for all your hard work. And the one thing I picked up on there is unity. Yeah. From everybody.